topic is, as you see, um, oxygenation of the newborn. And uh, here are the objectives of my talk. Uh, I've tried to summarize the present basis and also the knowledge gap regarding oxygenation of the newborn. And I've talked about delivery room handling, uh, both for term, near term, and also preterm babies. Uh, and then I will uh, also talk about oxygen saturation targets for for immature babies beyond the delivery room. Um, <coughs> and then we have some uh, new data uh, which um, have not been published in full yet regarding the prognostic uh, value of saturation and heart rate at five minutes. Uh, so I will show you some of these uh, data. And then um, I just uh, at the end we'll talk a little bit about epigenetic uh, consequences of uh, uh, hyperoxia and the possible long-term effects of such uh, changes. So that's uh, that's what I am aiming at uh, covering. Now, what is the goal of oxygen therapy? Um, first of all, it's to provide sufficient oxygen to the tissues and to avoid anaerobic metabolism and to prevent hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and to promote brain and somatic growth. Now, what we would like to measure is uh, <coughs> probably oxygen delivery. We cannot do that, so we're measuring oxygen tension, PO2 or uh, saturation. But which factors are of importance for oxygen delivery? Well, it's the oxygen content in the blood and and this is again, of course, dependent on the hemoglobin value and oxygen saturation, cardiac output, oxygen extraction by the tissues. What, what do you think? Do you think that oxygen delivery in a newborn is marginal or is it generous? Well, it is approximately three times higher than the demand. And that is good because we know that sick newborns might be marginal, but in general, uh, oxygen delivery is, is very generous, also f in newborns. Uh, just mentioning um, uh, fetal hemoglobin, uh, it has a high affinity to oxygen, but it also facilitates the unbinding of uh, oxygen in the tissues when the PO2 is low. So this is an important um, uh, effect of hemoglobin F. Now, we all know that oxygen is critical to life, uh, but too much oxygen in the newborn can cause a number of um, ill defects, ill uh, effects, uh, oxidative stress, lung injury, uh, other diseases, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, ROP, brain damage or impaired brain development. We also know that it can damage uh, heart, kidneys, and other vital organs. And I, I don't have time to go into that, uh, that uh, part of it. So let's um, uh, go directly to the delivery room. How much oxygen should we give when we resuscitate the newborn? Or maybe it's difficult to, to or I shouldn't ask such a question because it's not so easy to, to answer it in a simple sentence. So let's start with term and near-term infants. This is, um, I think, the latest um, meta-analysis of all the studies, 10 studies uh, carried out where term uh, or near-term infants were randomized or pseudo-randomized to be resuscitated initially with 100% or uh, oxygen or uh, room air. Um, I know there is a Cochrane review in the pipeline, a new Cochrane review. I haven't seen it in, in press yet. Uh, but what this uh, meta-analysis showed was that mortality is um, reduced significantly, approximately 30%. If you start recitation with air instead of 100% oxygen, and this was the reason why ILCOR in 2010 changed their guidelines from 100% oxygen and stating that in term and pre uh, near term infants in need of positive pressure ventilation, it is best to start with air. 
So that was a shift in the paradigm eight years ago. We tried to illustrate uh, what we think is happening when we resuscitate with air versus oxygen. So here is first, we try to illustrate what happens when we use air. And here is the PO2. It, after asphyxia, it increases from low levels up to physiological levels. It takes some time. Maybe that's good. And some free radicals are generated, but not that much. By contrast, if we resuscitate with 100% oxygen, you see this enormous PO2 peak. And this is exactly what happened in newborns in old days when we resuscitated with 100% oxygen. And we know today that such a peak is detrimental. And we also believe that you get such, I call it a tsunami of free radical production when you resuscitate with 100% oxygen. Now, such hyperoxia has a number of effects on the, on the baby. It leads to cerebral vasoconstriction um, and inflammation in the brain. The first time we saw that, we saw that in the piglet studies 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago. I was very surprised because I, I wouldn't have been surprised to find inflammation in the lungs, but also in the brain. It leads to increased pulmonary vascular reactivity. It means that if you resuscitate with 100% oxygen, it might induce more pulmonary hypertension. And actually one of the arguments against using air for newborn resuscitation was that we need oxygen in order to reduce the pulmonary uh, arterial pressure. That was an argument I heard numerous times when I was speaking about this. But in fact, the opposite is happening. You increase the risk of pulmonary hypertension if you... I try to turn off this. If you resuscitate with 100% um, oxygen. And we also know that oxygen in the delivery room, just a few minutes, until 10 minutes, oxygen exposure, is associated with an increased risk of childhood malignancy, especially leukemia, a threefold increased risk. So there are lots of arguments why we shouldn't uh, make the newborns hyperoxic. But it's not only in the delivery room you have to be careful with the oxygen. This is an observational study from Dallas, Texas, um, <coughs> by Capadia, where they measured the PO2 of asphyctic babies, babies who had been resuscitated, and they measured the PO2 at the admission to the NICU. And what you can see here is that those babies who had a very high PO2, very high, they had almost a fourfold increased risk of moderate to severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Now you can argue, argue that, well, these babies who had a higher PO2, they were sicker. That's why they were given more oxygen, sicker than these. But uh, the authors really looked into that and couldn't find that there was a difference in, uh, in the d degree of disease. Uh, anyway, it's not a randomized study, of course, but uh, I think it uh, indicates that there is an uh, association between moderate, severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy <coughs> and the degree of hyperoxemia. I wrote, a, a, I wrote a, an editorial when this was published in Journal of Pediatrics, and, and I made a calculation how many babies in the U.S. can avoid or doesn't need hypothermia treatment just by keeping the oxygen level in the physiologic range, and it was several thousand uh, babies. So this is an important uh, point to remember. Not only the delivery room you should be careful with oxygen, but also beyond the delivery room. So what about the preterm baby? Which FiO2 should we start with? Well, we know that the premature infant is different from the term in many respects, and we, we try to to 
um, show some of them here. They, first of all, they have a mature antioxidant system. They have an altered circulatory response, poor ventilation, ineffective gas exchange. This may in some lead to poor pulmonary vascular transition and respiratory failure. Now, the question is, should we, if preterm babies, and now we're talking about babies less than 32 weeks, um, should we start with a high FiO2 or should we start with a low FiO2? Well, up to now, there's approximately 11 studies uh, published where, where <coughs> preterm babies have been randomized to high or low FiO2. And high FiO2 we define as oxygen between 60 to 100 and a low between air 21 and 30 percent. So this is um, our most recent meta-analysis published just a year ago. Um, <coughs> and here is the um, uh, death. Here you have the studies. And what you can see here, there's absolutely no effect on mortality, whether you start high or low. And then, of course, if there's no effect on the mortality or other adverse effects, we want to start low. But there's absolutely no, you see there, relative risk 0.99. Um, we looked at some secondary outcome measures as BPD, interventricular hemorrhage, and again, there's no effect. Even on BPD, it, it doesn't matter whether we start high or low. Interventricular hemorrhage, the same. Uh, ROP, grade three, or above, no effect. There is a tendency that there is more necrotizing enterocolitis if you start low, but it's not significant. Uh, PDA, which you always have heard is oxygen sensitive, but it's absolutely no effect on the PDA in need of therapy, uh, which uh, initial FiO2 you are starting, are using. Um, also, yes, uh, yes, <laughs> not yesterday, but last year we, we published a torpedo trial, <coughs> which was an Australian-based uh, study where babies less than 32 weeks were randomized to air or 100% oxygen. Now, this um, study was stopped um, prematurely because it was difficult to recruit babies into the 100% oxygen arm. And now we, can s we will see in a while, and you can uh, judge yourself, was it correct to stop the trial? Well, first of all, there was no difference in mortality when we looked at the whole cohort. But then we did a secondary analysis of babies less than 28 weeks. And to our surprise, I would say also to our concern, we saw that there was a significant higher, significant higher mortality in babies less than 28 weeks, started with the air compared with 100% oxygen. Relative risk 3.9. So based on this um, data we have so far, we have made this uh, graph here, which is, is not so difficult to interpret as, as it looks, uh, but we say one size does not fit all when you're talking about preterm babies. Here we have odds rates of relative risk for mortality at the y-axis. Here we have gestational age. And um, here we have the, the medium with confidence intervals. And you know that if confidence intervals do not cross one, it means that one therapy uh, is significant compared with the other. Um, and if it's under this line here of one, it means that it favors low oxygen. If it's above, it favors oxygen uh, supplementation. So for babies uh, above 31 weeks, you see here confidence intervals do not cross one, and they're quite narrow because we have quite a, quite a lot of babies, more than 2,000 babies. So for these babies, we should still start with air if they need recitation. Babies between 28 and 31 weeks, you see confidence intervals cross one. Yeah, so we don't know whether we should start with air or we should give some oxygen. But there is a tendency to higher mortality in the air group. 
For babies above, uh, less than 28 weeks, you see confidence intervals do not cross one. They're very wide because we don't have much data. We don't have many babies in this group. We need more studies. But so far, we, we have to say that there is an increased risk of mortality if we start with air for babies less than 28 weeks. So this is uh, what we suggest now. Term and near-term infants start with air, adjust according to the saturation, I'll come back to that. Preterm babies between 28 and 31 weeks start with 21 to 30 percent, adjust according to saturation, preterm babies less than 28 weeks. Do not start with air. As we suggest 30 percent. Now you can argue why 30 percent, not 40 percent. Well, the reason for that is very simple, because we don't have data on 40 percent. There has not been any studies testing out 40 percent versus 100 percent, or 40 percent versus air. So there's a lot of do, a lot to do in this field still. <coughs> now the question is uh, why do the immature babies need some oxygen to get started? Well, we, we don't know, but, but maybe there's a clue from a study by Stuart Hooper in Melbourne and Arjen Tapas, um, where they studied immature rabbit kittens to nine days old, and put, they put them in air first. Here's the breathing rate, it's uh, slow, and then they put them in oxygen, Breathing rate increased, put them in nitrogen, breathing rate decreased, oxygen increased again. What happened? Well, they also measured the time the glottis was open. <coughs> and it seems that even if it opens slowly here, when, you are, when they're breathing air, it goes f opens more or faster when they breathe oxygen. Nitrogen is closed again, oxygen opens up. Everybody of you who has been ventilating a newborn baby with baggy mass knows that it's it almost impossible if the glottis are closed. We have to get the glottis opened, and maybe they need some oxygen <coughs> in order to <coughs> open the glottis. Now, <coughs> a few words about um, how saturation should develop the first minutes. After birth, uh, we have um, now a group of approximately 700 babies which have been resuscitated with different FiO2s. Uh, and we tried to, to follow these babies. And so he here I picked out babies less than 29 weeks. Uh, um, yeah, we have 768 babies now, so we are following. The shaded here is the minutes after birth. Here's the saturation. The shaded area here is the recommendation, the targets recommended by the American Heart Association. And these here are the targets recommended by the European Recitation Council. Now, none of these recommendations are evidence-based. It's only the best guess. So then we have followed babies resuscitated with air here, 30% oxygen, 60 or 65% oxygen, and 90 to 100% oxygen. And you can see that only the babies who were given 90 to 100% oxygen were at the target within two minutes. All the others, it took six, seven minutes, eight minutes, until they reached the target. We don't know if this is good or bad, but uh, I think it's an interesting <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> observation. Now, what is the impact of the saturation, for instance, at five minutes? Well, we looked at that. And uh, <coughs> for instance, in the torpedo trial, we found that those babies who had a reached a saturation at five minutes of 80% or more had a significantly reduced risk of uh, death or disability compared with those who did not reach the saturation of 80% at five minutes. You see, adjusted odds ratio is 0.5, and this is significant. 
And then when we did uh, the follow-up, which was published just last month or in September, we see that cognitive function um, was significantly higher in uh, <coughs> those who had a saturation of 80% or more at five minutes compared with those who did not reach saturation. Now, does this mean that uh, we should aim at a saturation of 80%? Does it mean that they are impaired because the saturation is lower? We don't know. It might be that they are sicker. That's why they don't reach the saturation. <coughs> we also looked at babies, the mortality, <coughs> and uh, again we saw that those who did not reach the saturation of 80% of five minutes had a significantly higher mortality, and also more intraventricular hemorrhage, grade three or more, but there was no difference in BPD. Now, in this cohort, almost 50% of the infants did not reach a saturation of 80% at five minutes of age. So again, what should we do with that? Uh, <coughs> because we know there are at risk, uh, increased risk of death and interventricular hemorrhage. Maybe we should carry out a randomized study. Uh, but I think it is very, very difficult to do that. I don't think anyone can randomize babies to keep the saturation under 80% the first five minutes. So <coughs> I'm afraid we will never do a randomized study in this field. <coughs> what about um, the heart rate at five minutes? Well, Vissel Kapadia is looking at the same cohort. Um, and. Um, uh, called uh, and doing what we call the Bradyprem study, which is uh, now it's not been published yet, but uh, hopefully it will be submitted soon. And the objective is to study the incidence of bradycardia in preterm infants less than 32 weeks in the delivery room and its impact on neonatal morbidity and mortality. And again, this is not a randomized study, of course. So he defined uh, defines <coughs> no bradycardia as a heart rate values, no heart rate values less than 100 beats per minute, transient bradycardia heart rate less than 100 beats per minute for one minute or less, and prolonged bradycardia heart rate less than 100 beats per minute for two minutes or more. Now, <coughs> when I looked at initial FiO2, high or low, it didn't have any impact on bradycardia or uh, prolonged bradycardia, which is good to know. Uh, so it's not, if you start with an FO2 of 21 or 30, it doesn't seem to increase the risk of uh, bradycardia. <coughs> However, if a baby had a prolonged bradycardia or have a, has a br prolonged bradycardia, there's an increased risk of mortality. You see here, relative risk, odds rate of 3.24, and this is uh, highly significant. So that's a poor sign, bradycardia at five minutes. <coughs> and it also seems to be a relation between the duration of bradycardia and uh, mortality. You see here, four minutes is an exception. I think that we don't have enough babies, but it seems to be pretty. Uh, close uh, association here. <coughs> so, those who did not reach heart rate of 100 beats per minute by five minutes were at increased risk of death. And again, we would love to have randomized studies, but again, I don't think we can do that. I think that uh, we have to say these are the data we have. Maybe we can get more observational data. Uh, but as long as these are the, the best data we have, we have to try to secure that the heart rate reaches <coughs> 100 within five minutes of age. <coughs> now, I will talk about oxygenation beyond the delivery room, and I'm sure that you all have heard about the Neoprom studies and know the, the results of the Neoprom studies where <coughs> 
Babies less than 28 weeks were randomized to target a low or a high saturation. So <coughs> the question was, what is the optimal target of saturation for preterm babies less than 28 weeks? That would result in <coughs> the minimal death or neurodisability. So there are five studies included in the NeoProms. It's the support trial from US. It's the COT trial from Canada. <coughs> and there are three boost trials, one from UK, one from Australia, and one from New Zealand. They have very similar protocol. There's some small differences. And as I mentioned, babies less than 28 weeks were randomized before they're 24 hours of age to um, a low saturation target, 85 to 89 percent, or a high saturation target, 91 to 95 percent. <coughs> and you see there's almost 5,000 babies in, in these uh, studies, so it's, it's a really big study, the Neoprom. So what was found was that um, there was more necrotizing enterocolitis in the low saturation group, but more importantly was that <coughs> they also found higher mortality. And that was, I must admit, it was a surprise when these data uh, came out. On the other hand, there was more ROP in the high saturation group. And this has uh, resulted in change in guidelines. Uh, for instance, the European guidelines in 2010 said oxygen saturation should be between 85 to 93. It's now been changed to be between 90 and 95. That's the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Europeans. Uh, a little bit different, 90 to 94. I'll come back to that. <coughs> so um, here we have the European guidelines from 2016. Where they say 90 to 94. With very, s very narrow alarm limits, and the alarm limits are very important when you're talking about this. So what we suggest is that alarm limits should be 89, the lower, and, and 95. The reason why we said 90 to 94 target, not 91 to 95, was that we don't want the saturation to increase above 95 <coughs> or 96, because then we don't know what the PO2 is. It could be very high. We don't have any control. So that's why we made this compromise, said 90 to 94. Four uh, meta-analyses have been uh, published uh, based on these data, uh, and they're listed here. And the primary outcome, death and or neurodevelopmental impairment, was no difference between the high or low saturation target babies. But mortality, you see 18% uh, uh, increased mortality in the low saturation babies. Neurodevelopmental impairment, no difference. ROP, approximately 25% reduction in the low saturation target babies. No effect on interventricular hemorrhage and no effect on BPD, which we all believe is uh, oxen, a condition which is uh, oxen dependent. Maybe that's wrong. <coughs> Necrotizing enterocolitis, more neck in uh, the low saturation target babies, and again, no effect on PDA. So maybe oxygen is not so important for PDA, after all. <coughs> so I, what I've done is I've looked at the risk differences um, from the Neoprom for these outcome measures. And if the staple is above this line, it means that um, it is um, beneficial to be in the high saturation target. And you see here, death is significantly increased in the low saturation targets. Um, neurodevelopmental impairment and death is not significant. Uh, necrotizing enterocolitis also benefits from a high saturation target. ROP benefits from a low saturation target. BPD here, yes, but if you define BPD physiologically, there's no 
effect of oxygen. So what the oxygen dependent factors here are death, necrotizing enterocolitis, and ROP. Now, <coughs> of course, people have been speculating a lot why is there a higher mortality in the low saturation groups. And um, uh, last year, one paper came out uh, from um, Richard Martin's group, uh, Di Fiore and co-workers, where they, they looked at mortality related to the growth status of the baby. And here they have, uh, you see here, we have four groups of babies. Uh, the red are babies in the high saturation target, 91 to 95, and the blue are those in the low saturation target. And then they have looked at small for gestation age um, alone, and what you can see here, here we have the low for gestation age babies um, in the low saturation target. And here we have, uh, they have uh, lower oxygen saturation, um, and uh, they also have, uh, yeah, not so much here, but here we have the time with hypoxemia and intermittent hypoxemia, much more in the small for gestation age compared with the three other groups. And when they looked at survival, there's one group that is different from the others, and that is um, uh, the small for gestation age in the low saturation target groups as you can see here, completely different from the all other groups. This is the median oxygen saturation, here is the intermittent hypoxemia, seems to be very bad for these babies. Um, and also, well, also intermittent hypoxemia defined a little bit differently. So everybody thought, that, okay, these babies should not be kept low. But then when they looked at the whole neoprom, population, they couldn't find any difference between the small for gestation age babies and those who were appropriate for gestation age. So this makes it, um, of course, very difficult uh, to draw conclusions. So the study found an association between median oxygen saturation during the first three days of life and infant survival at 90 days in both infants born appropriate and small for gestation age. It seems that this, um, um, the saturation, the first three days of life, has a, a long-term effect on the babies, 90 days at least. Um, in contrast, the association between time with hypoxemia and incidence of intermittent hypoxemia events with decreased survival was limited to the infants born small for gestational age. Therefore, maintaining extremely low gestational age infants, and especially infants born small for gestational age, at the higher end of recommended guidelines during the first few days of life may improve infant survival. So that was the, the conclusion from data from the support trial. But as I mentioned, when they looked at the whole uh, cohort, the neoprom cohort, they couldn't reproduce this. I would, if you ask me, I would still say, yes, I would keep this, these babies a little bit higher in the high uh, range of the target. This is um, another study. Uh, this is by Christian Poets in Tübingen, and he looked at the association between intermittent hypoxemia uh, on this side here, or bradycardia here, and late death or disability. So, what he found was that, oops, we found that was that, for instance, um, mortality is significantly related to the time of hypoxemia. Also, this is cognitive or language. Well, I can't read it myself. Language delay again significant and major, yeah, motor Im impairment here. So, so it seems that hypoxemia plays an important role for the outcome. It couldn't find the same regarding bradycardia, there's some tendencies, but it's not significant. Now, after these data came out, and I'm very keen to hear 
which recommendations you are using here in, in Ukraine. Um, but after these recommendations came out, uh, I think all the international bodies I know of say now oxygen saturation should be between 1994 and 91 to 95. And then we know that the, c the price we have to pay is perhaps more ROP. And yes, now they report more ROP. This is a Swedish study showing that there's more ROP in western part of Sweden after they changed their practice. Now, what I will say ab about this paper is that they didn't define the, the alarm limits. So we don't know how, how far up, how, how high the saturation was in this group. But it's concerning, and there are several reports now saying that, yes, we observe more ROP. Fortunately, there was no more blindness in the neoprom between the two groups, but more ROP. Maybe that's the price we have to pay in order to reduce mortality. And we can discuss what is the correct balance. And then, um, yeah, my time is soon now. Just a few words. I just want to show you some very recent data. It's not clinical data, but it's uh, data we did, we, we got from um, a study in newborn mice, um, where we, we put the newborn mice into either hyperoxia or normoxia for 14 days. This is a well-established model to um, produce BPD-like changes in the lungs of, of rodents. So we use that, and you see that in order to get these pups survived, the mothers had to be switched between the oxygen and the, the air chamber. So after 14 days in hyperoxia, there were 14 days in normoxia, and then we harvested the, um, the tissues. Here we see them here in the nest. And um, we looked at DNA hypermethylation. We also looked at uh, genomic changes, but now I want to show you this uh, DNA uh, hypermethylation. Here's what the look, uh, lungs look like in hyperoxia. This large um, alveoli, it seems that there is uh, alveolar arrest, uh, typical for BPD. So what we found was that uh, 1,000 genes were DNA hypermethylated in the lung, and especially genes related to GGF beta um, pathways. I don't think we, you need to be a geneticist or to, to see the difference between these two groups. Um, um, so it's very striking. Now, TGF beta plays an important role for lung development and probably also for development of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Um, and uh, so what we have shown is that um, hyperoxia increases methylation of, of important genes of the TGF beta pathway. Now, what we, we don't know is whether such changes are transitory, transitory or if they're permanent. We have just uh, received the data from the brain, in the same animals. We have not finished the analysis yet, but we have found some interesting uh, epigenetic changes also in the brain. That I can tell about next year or later. So, just to summarize, oxygen targets between 91 to 95 increase ROP in need of therapy, but not severe vision injury. Fortunately, no more blindness has been sh shown. Oxygen targets between 85 to 89 percent increased mortality and necrotizing anticholitis. <coughs> Long-term follow-up, there's no differences between the arms regarding death, disability, blindness, hearing loss. Hyperoxia may lead to epigenetic changes in the lung. And as I mentioned, we don't know if these are transient or long-lasting. So maybe if you have had BPD as a baby or a small child, uh, you never healed from it. You, you, you maybe you have epigenetic changes the rest of your life. So this is just to summarize. We are not there yet that we can individualize the oxygen therapy 
but we can individualize more than we could some years ago. So, as I mentioned, babies less than 31 weeks in the delivery room start with air. 28 to 31 weeks, we suggest to start with air or 30% oxygen. I think many will say 30% oxygen. Less than 28 weeks, start with 30% oxygen. For all gestational ages, adjust according to the saturation if you have a pulse oximeter. Well, randomized studies to test significance of saturation uh, at five minutes, or heart rate at five minutes. I don't know. I doubt we can do such studies. I would like to hear your opinion about that. Beyond delivery room in immature babies, target between 91 to 95. That's what is recommended by American Academy of Pediatrics. And the European recommendation on 90 to 94 and I don't think they will be changed when the new guidelines are coming out next year. Alarm limits 90 to 96 or 89 to 95. The Europeans and the Americans, they are quarreling here because it's not about the targets, but it's about alarm limits. Well, just uh, want to inform you that it's not only in neonatology, people are now interested in lower oxygen load. Uh, this was a, a large study um, published in The Lancet uh, half a year ago, where they looked at a uh, huge number of, of uh, patients with cardiac conditions. And they looked at mortality in those who have been treated with what they call the conservative oxygen therapy versus a liberal oxygen therapy. And Mortality, mortality is higher if oxygen therapy is liberal. So, 30 years after neonatology, the adult medicine uh, are following us, which I think is uh, interesting. Uh, for those who are interested in this topic, we just published um, a review article in Pediatric Research. Uh, it's just online uh, a couple of weeks ago, a week ago or so. And I would like to, to thank my collaborators. This is an international group. We are following this cohort of more than 700 babies. Uh, Satya and Laxmin Rushima, who is at UC Davis in California. Max Vento from Valencia. I've been working with Max since the middle of the 90s. Vishal Kapadia from Dallas and Julie Owe from Sydney. Um, and I'd like to thank you for the attention and for hospitality. And yesterday we had a great day at the restaurant. Uh, so uh, I don't know if this is typical Ukraine or not, but thank you very much. <laughs>and uh, I think that in the future we will use NIRS, especially to look at the brain, but not only the brain. We, we just finished a study in newborn piglets where we did the NIRS studies of the intestine during hypoxia and reoxygenation. So I think it will be uh, um, used more routinely in the future, but I think we need more data. <coughs> Thank you very much for your presentations. Very, very nice informations, very new, big new informations. Well, um, um, I have questions to you. What do you think about uh, use closed loop ventilation in the delivery room? In the delivery room, yeah. okay, stabilization, stabilization sick babies, automatically adjusted oxy oxygen uh, devices. I mean, if I adjusted baby for closed loop ventilator, maybe this baby more stable. I'm not sure I, I, I caught your question. Okay, uh, closed huh? loop ventilations. Pardon? 
Oh, closed loop. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In well, I should have room. In delivery room. Yeah, yeah. Well, I should. Uh, I had some slides. Uh, I, I didn't include those. Uh, uh, closed loop is very uh, in the delivery room. I don't know, but beyond the delivery room, no, 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 no only in the delivery room. In I the delivery room, yes. I can't answer that. But but uh, what I can say is that um, uh, I don't think it's time to use it in the routine yet. Not in the, the in the NICU and and not in the delivery room. Because it's a very interesting pathway to improve our mm, uh, treatment to the sick babies. Yes, but I I don't I haven't seen any. I don't remember any studies with closed loop in the delivery room. Maybe <laughs> I have forgotten. <laughs> Do you remember, Steve? No. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question. If, for example, if we talked about children after a delivery room and about the target saturation during the first months of life. Were there any studies that would compare, for example, a lower target saturation, 89, 92, during the first two weeks, when there is the first stage of retinopathy is seen, and higher in the subsequent weeks of life? Or are we talking about target saturation, which is the same since the first day of life until the end of the whole neonatal period? Yeah, as far as I understand your question, you ask whether we should keep the saturation the same the whole neonatal period, or we should change it, start it lower and then increase it. And that's a very good comment and question. Um, and it might be that it I is optimal to, to change the saturation target according to the maturation of the child. The problem is that we don't have any data uh, to support that. So we have to do the studies before we can change the practice. So as I said, there's a lot to do in this field. And we need a number of studies in order to answer all the questions. And for instance, I showed the data only for babies less than 28 weeks. We don't know which saturation targets we should aim at for babies at 29 weeks, or 30 weeks, or 31 weeks. We, we don't have any data as far as I know, or very little data.